Sam was so proud of himself. He had gone two years without smoking a cigarette. At the age of 14, Sam was already puffing away on his favorite brand of cigarettes, Marlboro. Even though people have to be over the age of 18 in America to buy cigarettes, Sam knew of a few stores that sold cigarettes without checking identification. Sam had spent seven years smoking. He was 21 when he decided to quit. Sam decided to quit after discovering he had been coughing blood. He would get tired quickly, and he noticed his teeth were getting really yellow. Whenever Sam would hang out with his friends that smoked, he would always want a cigarette really badly, but was always strong and said no when they offered him one. Before Sam quit, he would go through a pack of cigarettes a week. The pack of cigarettes usually cost him $5.25. As a way to encourage himself to stop smoking, Sam decided to save his money every week. After two years, Sam took out all his money he had saved from not smoking and saw that he had saved $504. He decided to buy a bicycle so he could ride it for fun and for exercise. As he started riding his bike more frequently, he noticed that he didn't think about smoking anymore. He didn't want a cigarette when he would hang out with his friends that smoked. Sam would ride his bike in the morning because he loved getting a breath of fresh air. In the past, when he smoked, the only time he got a breath of fresh air was when he went out for a cigarette. He enjoyed being outside, breathing in the air that would hit his face as he rode his bike through the town. Music had always played a big role in Jonathan's life. He liked different types of music, from hip-hop to rock and roll. One of his favorite bands was the Beatles. He could hear them every day. Jonathan didn't feel that way towards any other band. He had all of their albums, and he knew all the lyrics to their songs. One day, Jonathan and his girlfriend Sarah went for a ride in Jonathan's car. Sarah was excited to show Jonathan a new band she had heard about. Sarah brought the CD and played it for Jonathan as they drove around town. The first song was called 40 Day Dream, and the band's name was Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. Jonathan didn't think much of them at first, maybe because he was driving, but after they stopped driving, he had the song stuck in his head. Jonathan decided to look for their albums. They had three out, so Jonathan decided to buy them all. During a rainy day, Jonathan invited Sarah to his house, and they listened to all three of their albums. Jonathan loved the band. He loved how they sounded like bands from the past. He loved how they reminded him of the Beatles. When he and Sarah were listening to the third album, the song If I Were Free came on. Jonathan jumped off his bed and started dancing alone. Sarah looked at him, smiled, and laughed. Jonathan started clapping, and then he started singing. The light became too heavy and I fell into a dream, he sang. He fell next to Sarah, looked at her, and said, I feel like I'm in a dream when I listen to this band. Thank you for introducing me to them. The night was calm in Los Angeles, although the wind was particularly chilly. Frank had gotten out of work in downtown Los Angeles, Around 11 p.m., he got his sweater, put his headphones on to listen to music, and put his backpack on. Frank liked taking his backpack to work 
because he could take a change of clothes to work so that he didn't have to wear his uniform after he got out. In order to get to his house, Frank had to take a bus and a train, but he didn't mind because he could listen to music. After getting off the train, Frank got something to eat at a little restaurant that stayed open late and served hamburgers. After eating, Frank still had to walk for 30 minutes. While Frank was walking through a small street with a lot of homes, he noticed there was a car behind him following him slowly. He looked back and noticed it was a police car. He didn't mind because he wasn't doing anything illegal, so he kept walking. As Frank was about to get home, the police car turned on the lights and drove directly to where Frank was at. They stopped and got out of the car. The two police officers surrounded Frank. Frank was used to this and put his hands in the air. The police officers told him to put his hands on the hood, which he did. As Frank was being searched, he asked the police officers why he was being searched. They ignored him and asked him questions. Do you have anything illegal on you? Have you been arrested before? Do you have a weapon? Frank answered no to all of their questions. They put Frank in the back of the police car. Frank asked again why he was being searched. One officer said, because you are walking around the neighborhood with a hooded sweatshirt. Frank had done nothing wrong, so the police let him go after searching his backpack. Jacqueline and her family were sleeping in their home. Their dog Scruffy was asleep next to Jacqueline. It was 4.36 a.m. and the night was quiet. There were no cars passing in the street. No noise could be heard. It was like everything was still. Jacqueline always put a cup with water next to her bed so that if she got thirsty during the night, she didn't have to walk all the way to the kitchen. That was when it happened. The furniture started shaking and the cup of water fell to the floor. Scruffy started barking and it woke up Jacqueline. She looked around and saw that all her stuff was shaking. She started screaming. Soon after, her father came in and told her to come out quick. It was an earthquake. Jacqueline was so scared and couldn't move. Her father went in and picked her up. He took her outside where Jacqueline's mother and brother were at already. Jacqueline and her brother were crying. They didn't understand what was happening. Luckily, Jacqueline's mother had prepared an emergency kit and had it outside. She looked for the key, which was hidden inside a fake rock, and unlocked the box. She pulled out blankets to keep her children warm. Jacqueline looked at her mother and took the blanket. She then saw her dad take a flashlight from the box. He used the flashlight to see if the house had any damage. The father knew the house was not safe, so they stayed up until someone could examine the house. The children didn't have school due to the earthquake, so they spent the day with their parents. Jacqueline was so proud of her parents because they knew what to do during this disaster. She talked to her friends, and they weren't so lucky. Jacqueline went up to her mother and father and hugged them because she knew she felt the protection of her parents. Albert had been playing the guitar almost all his life. His first guitar was given to him by his father. It was a Fender Stratocaster, and Albert absolutely loved it. As a young boy, Albert would spend hours and hours listening to songs, 
trying to learn them on his guitar. As he grew older, he didn't play the guitar as much. He met a girl and they started dating. Eventually, they had a son. Every once in a while, Albert would take out the old Fender Stratocaster and play a song for his baby son named Max. He loved playing guitar for Max because it would calm him down when he started crying. As Max got older, he started listening to the same kind of music his father listened to. Albert and his son would listen to music together and talk about what they thought the songs meant. During Max's 10th birthday, Albert gave his son a Fender Stratocaster as well, the same model his father had gotten him. It cost him a bit more, but he wanted his son to have the same one as his. Max was happy. He asked his dad to teach him all the songs he knew. Albert smiled and said, Of course. When Max turned 17, he joined a band. They played local shows and were able to record some songs by themselves. One day, as Max was walking home from band practice, someone stopped him and took away his guitar. He was devastated. He went home and locked himself in his room. He couldn't face his dad. He knew he had let him down. When it was time for dinner, Max opened his bedroom door and saw his dad's Fender Stratocaster on the guitar stand. There was a letter and a set of keys on the guitar. The letter said, To my guitar hero, Max, here is my guitar. You need it more than I do, and the key to your new car, so nothing like this will happen to you again. A school bus transporting Maxwell High School students overturned on the corner of Seeley Street and Wilton Avenue. The driver of the bus was trying to avoid hitting a car that passed a red light, and the bus overturned with 37 students inside. The driver suffered minor injuries to the face, and two students broke their arms. Roger Peterson, principal of Maxwell High School, said that the driver was not at fault. His reaction helped prevent any serious injuries. As soon as the bus overturned, the driver opened the door using the emergency handle and started evacuating the students one by one. He notified the police of the students that were injured. We teach our drivers to ensure the safety of the students first, Peterson said. The driver, whose name is not being released at the moment due to an investigation, along with the two students, are being treated at Belmont Hospital. The parents were notified as soon as possible by school officials. According to John Pineda, who witnessed the accident, the school bus almost hit the car. The bus wasn't going that fast, but the other car was. If the bus had hit the car, those people inside would surely have been seriously injured or worse, Pineda said. Pineda also said that the driver of the school bus took precaution to turn where people weren't walking. If he were to have made a right rather than a left, he would have definitely hit people that were crossing the street. Peterson issued a statement saying that the students who were inside the bus could miss school the next day to make sure they were okay and relax with their family. According to Peterson, the police provided him with a list of students that were involved in the accident. Police are looking for the driver of the car that passed the red light. It was a white Honda Civic. Anthony was a senior at high school and had a car. 
even though Anthony wasn't 21, which is the legal age to buy alcohol, he would occasionally have a drink with his friends. Anthony was excited because today was his prom day. He had his tuxedo on and had a flower for his date. He got into his car and went to pick up his friend Jacob and then to pick up Jennifer, his date. When they showed up to the prom, Jacob's date and Jennifer went to the restroom. Jacob took out a small bottle of whiskey from his jacket pocket and told Anthony to take a drink. Anthony took some and didn't like it, but he still drank. As Anthony and Jennifer danced, he began to feel dizzy. He was drunk. Anthony, are you okay? Jennifer asked. Anthony looked at her and laughed. She figured out that he was drunk and decided to leave with Jacob's date. Anthony got mad and decided to leave. He got in his car and left. As he was driving down Mental Avenue, he saw a police car following him. He got nervous and started chewing gum. Anthony was looking at the police car through his mirror so much that he almost took a red light. When the police saw this, he stopped Anthony. The police gave him a few tests to see if he had been drinking, and Anthony failed them. The police took him away. His father picked him up, and they went to talk to a lawyer. The lawyer said that Anthony would have to take alcohol education classes, go to Alcoholics Anonymous, do community service, and pay a fine. Anthony's father said that Anthony would have to get a job as well to pay for the fine. Anthony decided never to drink after that. He said that it wasn't worth it. Claudette's dad didn't let her have a boyfriend. He told her that 12-year-olds aren't supposed to have boyfriends. Claudette always wanted a boyfriend, but didn't want to get her dad mad. She would always go to the library after school to study and wait for her dad to pick her up. One day, a boy named Stephen decided to go up to Claudette and say hi. Hello, my name is Stephen. I've seen you here before, he said. Oh, hello, my name is Claudette. I always come here to study and wait for my dad. I live a bit far, she said. Stephen asked Claudette if he could sit with her so he didn't have to study alone. Claudette said yes. They started studying and started talking. Soon they weren't studying at all. They began talking about music, books, movies, and what they liked to do for fun. Stephen had to leave before Claudette's dad came to pick her up, and he asked her if she would be back tomorrow so that they could study together again. Claudette said yes. The next day, Stephen showed up and saw Claudette. He sat down, and she smiled at him and said hello. They began talking about their classes and what they were learning at school. After they talked for an hour, Claudette told him she had to go look for a book and if he could go with her. Stephen agreed and went to look for the book with Claudette. As they were looking for the book, Claudette was in one aisle and Stephen was in another. Claudette took out a book and saw Stephen was looking at her. She smiled and he told her she was beautiful. She was happy he said that, because she really liked him. Claudette asked him if he wanted to be her boyfriend. Stephen said yes. As they were hugging, Claudette's dad came in and saw them. He split them up and took Claudette by the hand. He told Stephen that he wouldn't be able to see her again. Stephen was sad. 
My big brother James has always been a good baseball player. He is six years older than me, but he always invites me to go play catch with him. It's one of my favorite things to do. We live next to a park. Whenever we get bored, we just cross the street and start throwing the ball around. The last time we went to the park, we were playing catch and also hitting some baseballs with our bats. Some guys came up to us because they wanted to play a game of baseball. They needed two more players, so they asked us to play with them. James asked me if I wanted to play, and I said yes. The guy's name was Christian, and he introduced us to all the guys. James introduced me and gave the guy our names. I asked Christian if I could play catcher. I always liked playing catcher at school. He said that I could, and James got first base. During the game, James got a home run, and I was excited for him. I got on the base twice, but I got out all the time. I was sad. But James told me not to worry and that it happens. After the game, Christian and the guys told James if he wanted to go grab a drink with them. I thought James was going to go because he likes to drink, but he told them that he was going to take me out to eat. We thanked them for the game, and Christian asked James for his phone number just in case they ever needed more players for a game. James gave it to him, and then we went to go eat at Jim's Burgers. I asked James why he didn't go to drink with the guys. He told me that he knew his responsibilities. I didn't know what he meant, but I was glad he didn't go. Now we could eat burgers and fries. George had always been a funny guy. I met him at the movie theater. I went to see the new Spider Man movie, and he was there dressed up like Spider Man. He was acting like Spider Man, and everyone was clapping for him and asking him for pictures. My girlfriend wanted to go take her picture with him, and I said, okay. When I went up to him, I asked him if it was okay to take a picture of him and my girlfriend. He said yes. I took the picture and started talking to him. He told me that his friends hadn't showed up yet and that he didn't want to sit alone. My girlfriend and I decided to sit with him. After we saw the movie, I asked him if he wanted to go grab a bite to eat. He accepted my invitation. He had me and my girlfriend laughing the whole drive to the restaurant. We talked a lot on the phone. We were big fans of Nintendo games. I invited him over to my house so we could play. George never had a bad thing to say about anyone. He told me once that there is good in everyone. Some are just afraid to show it. George had invited me to his house one day to play old Nintendo games. But when I showed up to his house, no one was there. I looked around and called him on his cell phone, but no one answered. I decided to leave and come back in an hour. When I got back to George's house, I saw that someone was inside. I knocked on the door, and an older woman came out. It was George's aunt. I asked her if George was home. She looked at me with sad eyes and said that George was in the hospital. I finally understood why George was the way he was. George had cancer, and the doctors told him that he could go at any time. That's why George was always looking for the humor in life, because his real life was filled with sadness. Johnny has always loved taking long walks. He lived close to Griffith Park in Los Angeles. The park is very beautiful. 
It has trees and winding roads leading up to the hills where he could get lost for hours. Whenever he hiked up there, he always felt at peace with the world and with himself. It was his personal safe zone. One day, Johnny was hiking up a trail that he had not tried before, and soon he was lost. Griffith Park is very large, and people have been lost up there in the past, but he knew he would find a way back. After about an hour of walking around in circles, Johnny heard something move in the bushes. It scared him for a second, but he just kept walking. It was starting to get dark, and he began thinking that he might have to spend the night in a cave or under a rock or something. That was when he heard more noise coming from the trail. It was very loud. Hey, Johnny shouted, what's out there? Stay away. He was sure it was a coyote or maybe a mountain lion. He started looking for something to fight back with in case of an attack. Johnny was in a full panic and started shaking uncontrollably as the noise got closer and closer. Just as he thought that an animal was going to jump out of the bushes, he saw the most beautiful girl he had ever seen in his life. She was tall and blonde and had long, straight hair, and the first thing she said was, Are you okay? It turned out her name was Sheila, and she was a park ranger. She told Johnny that she had seen him walk up the trail earlier, but did not see him come back down, so she decided to come up to see if everything was okay. Johnny had never been so embarrassed in his life, but that was okay. The couple ended up getting married a little more than a year after that. She saved Johnny's life that day in more ways than one. I had the most wonderful childhood. I grew up in San Diego, where it rains about two days a year, and it's always sunny and bright. I could ride my bike just about any day of the year and had lots of friends. My best friend was George Kenny. George lived just a few houses down the block from me, and we were the same age. Actually, I was about 28 days older than him, a fact that I always threw in his face. You must respect your elders, I would sometimes tell him. That usually got a nasty response from him. Anyway, George came up to me one day and said, Hey Richard, why don't we form a bicycle club? I thought about it for a while, and then he said we could give ourselves a cool name and get hats and stickers and have lots of fun. What do you say? I immediately fell in love with the idea. You bet, Georgie Porgy. I used to call him that all the time, even though I knew he hated it. Well, before we knew it, we got a couple of other guys together and came up with the best name for a club ever. We were the White Skulls. Why we chose that name, I'll never know but all the kids seemed to like it, so I was okay with it, too. The four of us went to the local bike shop, and we each picked out a skull decal to put on our bikes. I chose a green one, while Georgie Porgy picked red. He shouted, I am the red skull. I am the king of the club. If you don't like it, try to take it from me. George was a pretty big guy, so no one argued with him. We rode our bikes everywhere and had a great summer. That's how we formed the greatest bike club ever.
Helen was outside watering her lawn like she does every other day. She loves her lawn and her garden. She has the prettiest house on the block, but it's only because she works at it very hard. Helen is in her mid-forties, but you wouldn't know it by looking at her. Her face is nearly wrinkle-free, and it seems she has more energy than people half her age. Good morning, Helen, I said as I walked outside on my way to work. Hi, Robert. How are you? She asked. Fine. I'm doing fine. Your yard is looking good, I said. And it was. Sometimes it really bothers me that I can't get my lawn to look as nice as hers. What's your secret, Helen? I asked. Secret to what? She answered. To having such a beautiful lawn. I water mine, I seed mine every year, and I still can't get it to look as good as yours. I'm jealous, I said with a smile. Helen just nodded and had this funny little look on her face that suggested she was just better at keeping her lawn nice than I was. I didn't like that look but I guess it's okay that she feels that way. I've known Helen since she was a little girl, and things have not gone well with her lately. She's been alone for a long time. She wasn't very pretty when she was young. She had terrible acne that covered her face from ear to ear. It made her very self-conscious, So she didn't go out on dates very much, but that all changed when she met Josh. They were together for more than 10 years until, sadly, they went their separate ways. Since then, Helen has nurtured and tended her garden as if it were her child. When I got home later that day, she was outside working on her roses I said hello to her as I walked to my door, and she smiled brightly. She looked beautiful. Alex was shopping at the local market yesterday, trying to find some fresh vegetables for his dinner that night. The market is in the neighborhood, and it is not one of the giant national big-name stores. It is a small store with only a few locations around Los Angeles. Alex likes these types of markets so much better than the superstores because there are real people running them. Alex knows the guy that runs the fruits and vegetables section at the market. His name is Diego, who was born in Tijuana, Mexico about 120 miles from Los Angeles. Diego always lets Alex know what is a good buy at the market. Hola, Diego, Alex said in Spanish. Hey, Alex, how are you? He answered in English. This happens every time Alex talks to Diego. Alex speaks to him in Spanish and Diego answers in English. Spanish is spoken a lot around L.A. The city has the largest population of Mexicans anywhere in the world, except Mexico City. Alex likes to show Diego how much Spanish he knows, and Diego also wanted Alex to know how much English he knows. It's so funny to hear a conversation like this. They sometimes get strange looks from people. Today, Diego got some beautiful oranges. They were big and plump and were at the right price, too. These are great, Alex. You will like them very much, said Diego. Alex responded with, Muy bueno, Diego which means very good, Diego. 
He also told Alex about some tasty cucumbers they had today, and Alex ended up buying a few of those too. When Alex left, he said, Buenos tardes, Diego, which is a Mexican farewell phrase. And Diego said, See you soon, my friend. Dennis had always been a terrible student. When he was a kid, his parents sent him to a Catholic school. He didn't know much about the school. Of course, he didn't know much about anything when he was six years old. But he did know one thing. All his friends from the neighborhood went to a public school. Dennis was the only boy that went to a private school, and his friends would often tease him about it. You're not one of us. You're not one of us, they would sometimes chant. He wasn't really alone, though. His friend Patricia also went to the Catholic school, but she was a girl. After a while, they began walking to the small school together every morning. Pat was the first girlfriend Dennis had ever had. She wasn't his girlfriend. She was just a friend who happened to be a girl. The nuns at the school were very mean. They ruled the school like it was a prison. Dennis was afraid to even raise his hand to ask a question. His mother was often called into meetings with the principal about Dennis, who would also sit in the office listening to the principal telling his mother how smart he was, but was very lazy. Needless to say, Dennis didn't do well in school and ended up going to a junior college after high school. He didn't do very well there either and soon dropped out. That all changed after Dennis grew up and started working. He had worked for many years before deciding he wanted to earn a degree after all. Dennis went back to school at the age of 30 and soon was a college graduate with a degree. It turned out Dennis wasn't as lazy as those nuns thought he was. When Mario was 19 years old, he bought his first car. It was a brand new 1985 Toyota Corolla. He was on top of the world. It was beautiful and was really fast and fun to drive. Living in Southern California without a car is not a good idea. The region is so spread out that it could take hours getting from one part of town to another if you use public transportation. You are not anyone in Los Angeles if you don't have a car, or at least that is what some people say. Before that, Mario had never owned or bought a car in his life. His father warned him about the salespeople. Don't ever pay the asking price, son, he said. Mario looked at him with disbelief. What do you take me for, Dad? I am not an idiot. I know not to pay the first offer, he screamed back. His dad offered to go with him to the car dealer, but Mario wanted to go alone. It was his money and his car, and he was determined to do this alone. When Mario got to the car dealer, a nice man came up to him and asked if he wanted to take the car he was looking at for a test drive. Mario said, yes, of course. So they went for a drive. Mario fell in love with the car, and the salesman knew immediately that he was going to make some money. 
it turns out that you should never let a salesman know you're interested in anything you want to purchase. Mario didn't know how to negotiate and wound up paying too much for the car. He really didn't care, though. He owned his first car. When he told his dad what he paid for it, he thought his dad was going to be mad. But he just said, That's okay, son. That same dealer ripped me off when I bought my first car, too. Phil grew up in a very poor family in a very poor town. It was pretty bad. Sometimes Phil and his sisters didn't have enough to eat and went to bed hungry. That was okay with Phil, though, because that was his life, and he thought it was just the way everybody in the world lived. Phil had a lot of fun and had many friends. It wasn't until Phil was about 12 years old that he began to realize that there were better things out there in the world. Phil and his best friend Albert would sit around and talk about getting out of this place to see the world. It was a fantasy, but it was a good fantasy. They really didn't know how they would do it, but they had a dream. Then one day, Phil's cousin Ralphie came to visit. Phil didn't know Ralphie very well. Ralphie grew up in Texas and was about eight years older than Phil. It had been years since Phil saw his cousin. That day, Ralphie changed Phil's life. Ralphie walked into the house wearing his Marine Corps uniform, and Phil knew at that moment that he wanted to become a Marine. Phil and Ralphie talked all night long. Ralphie told him all about the Corps, and Phil was fascinated. Ralphie was wearing his medals and awards, and his uniform was so neat and clean that Phil wanted to join at that moment. Five years later, Phil enlisted in the Marines. He was 17 and needed his mom's permission. His mom said, Where do I sign? Of course, she was joking, but she knew Phil was going to do this. It was his way out of this place, so she gave him her blessings. The day Phil left, he promised his mom he would be back. He kept his promise. He came back several times over the years and helped his family as much as he could. David must have been the only kid in America that did not like summer vacation. Every year, between the beginning of June through the end of August, school kids were on vacation. Only to David, summer vacation meant work, work, and more work. His dad was a workaholic. He had two jobs most of the time. He had one job during the day and the other at night, but sometimes he worked on weekends too. The man had more energy than any person alive. When he wasn't working on weekends at his third job, he worked at home, and that was why David hated summer vacation. His dad was always building something or tearing something down. If he wasn't tearing down a wall or adding a new room to the house, he was putting in a new driveway or garage. It was living hell for a 13-year-old kid. While all of David's friends were off playing baseball or riding their bicycles, he was usually hauling bricks or mixing cement. That's what he remembers about his childhood. David always knew he was in trouble whenever he heard, Where's David? His dad's voice seemed to carry down the street. That phrase could only mean it was time to get to work. Of course, David learned throughout the years 
how to make himself disappear at just the right times, but his dad usually found him anyway. But dad, I want to go to the park to play with my friends, David would say. You can waste time with your buddies some other time. It's time to get to work now, his dad would respond. It got so bad that David would intentionally fail classes so he would have to go to summer school. Summer school was for students who didn't do well during the regular school year, but he didn't care. It meant less work. It meant freedom. Every June, my old elementary school has a carnival on its ground. This has been happening since I was a little boy. I used to have so much fun there. It was amazing. It had rides like the Ferris wheel and the flying teacups. The Ferris wheel was this huge wheel that carried two people in a giant circle above the rest of the carnival. I remember the first time I got on it when I was seven years old. I had been begging my mom for months to let me ride it. Please, mom, please. I'm big enough now, I would scream. However, she kept saying, You're too young, Billy. Maybe one day. Of course, seven year old kids have short memories. I kept asking over and over again until she finally said okay, but she said she was going with me. I'm a big boy, Mom. I can go alone, I said. She would not agree. We're going together or not at all, she said. And of course, I said, okay. When the big day came, I was so excited. I almost had an accident while waiting in line. The guy who was seating people kept saying, next, as more and more people got on and the line kept shrinking. His shouts of next kept getting louder and louder, and I knew my time was coming up. When we finally reached the end of the line, it felt like I waited a month. We got on and put on our seatbelts. I was excited and afraid at the same time. Then it started. I went so high up in the air that I got dizzy. My stomach began to turn, and I felt like throwing up. It was just too fast and too high for me. I didn't get sick, but I was sure glad I was on the ground again when I told my mom, Please don't send me up there again, Mom. Going to an all boy high school was no fun. Joe's parents thought it would be a good idea to send him there instead of a public school because he would get distracted by girls, as his mom would say. Once during his third year, Joe begged his mom to let him go to public school. I just want to be normal, he would tell her. I want to meet girls. I don't want to be weird. But his words always fell on deaf ears. Mom always said that Joe had plenty of time to go on dates after high school and that he needed to concentrate on his schoolwork. This usually made him very sad, but like a good kid, Joe just nodded his head and went on with his studies. That all changed one day when Joe met Carmen, who lived just two blocks away from him. One day he ran into her at the market by chance. They had gone to kindergarten together. They were also of the same age. She was in Joe's class, and she remembered Joe too. After about two weeks, they were going study. Joe was so happy but had to hide his relationship from his parents, which was okay 
Because Carmen was hiding him from her family, too. Are you kidding me? Carmen said. They would kill me if they knew I had a boyfriend. <clears throat> Everything was going great for a time, but Joe's mom was right. His grades started slipping, and he soon was on academic probation because he was spending too much of his free time with Carmen. She also dropped a grade or two. As a result, both of them had to go to summer school to improve their grades, but Joe didn't care. He was in love, and that was all that mattered at the time. Much later, he came to realize his mom was